And Jesus called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out demons. He told them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He did allow them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. And so the disciples went out, telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and they healed many sick people, anointing them with oil. The apostles returned to Jesus and they, from their ministry tour and they told him everything that they had done and taught. And then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And so people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and they said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms or villages to buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to buy enough food for all of these people. Jesus uh, asked them, how much bread do you have? Go and find out. They came back and they reported, we got five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so in groups of 50 and 100, they sat. Then Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up towards heaven and he blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed that day. Now, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that the disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. And after saying goodbye uh, to everyone, he went up into the hills by himself alone to pray. Now, late that night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake. Jesus was alone on land, but he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. And so about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said, take courage, I am here. And then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed because they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it all in. And after they crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. They brought the boat to shore and they climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once and they ran throughout the whole area, carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, in villages, cities, out in the countryside, they brought the sick to the marketplaces. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe and all who touched it were healed. Welcome to episode six of Shook. If you've been following along with us for the last few weeks, Jesus has done some pretty shocking things. He's, he's cast out demons, he's healed people, uh, he's upset the status quo, he even raised somebody from the dead. But today, in Mark chapter six, he's going to do, and he just heard him do, what I think is the most shocking thing yet. Did you catch it? In case you didn't, let me, um, let me maybe explain what's so shocking about today with a, with a different metaphor. Imagine, 
that you had the opportunity to go observe a surgery. And you got to go sit in the, in the chairs around, everything kind of over the arena, and you got to see all of the, the machines uh, that were there and beeping and presumably doing things besides beeping that machines are there for. You got to see all of the staff, all of the team, the, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, the surgeon themselves, and you got to see all those people gathered together. You got to see the patient who had been so carefully prepped by being put in a robe that does not cover nearly as much as the robe should probably cover. It probably marked one leg, right, with an X, you know, like don't, don't cut off this leg, right? Like leave that one, like operate on this leg. You know, they'd done all the things, everything was ready to go. They'd arrayed all of the instruments and tools that they needed, they were all sterilized and laid out in order so that the surgeon wouldn't have to fumble in the midst of anything. And as you're watching, ready for this surgery to begin, the surgeon stops and he looks up in the audience and he points at you. And he says, you, come down here. Come here right now. And you, and you walk down, stand next to the surgeon, and the surgeon picks up the scalpel, hands it to you, and says, you operate on this person. Wouldn't you flip? Like, would that not be the most absurd, horrifying thing you could think of? He hands you the scalpel, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with this? And you're just hoping that no one in the audience is eating junior mints right now, but you, you don't even know. And you know that if you do cut into this person, like, you're gonna get sued, right? You are not licensed to practice as a surgical professional. As absurd as this scenario sounds, this is what Jesus does in today's episode, right? God has come down to earth and is doing things that make sense for God to do. He has all the power of the universe. He wants to heal people, he can heal people. He wants to cast out demons, he can do that. Uh, we even saw last week, he wants to calm the wind and the waves, he wants to bring the dead back to life. Frankly, all of that is within the purview of someone who is God. But then, in the midst of this, Mark tells us that as he's been doing all these things for a couple of years, he suddenly, without warning, turns to his disciples and says, you do it. Wouldn't you flip? Uh, hang on, Jesus, you want us to be the ones casting out demons? That seems like more like God stuff. Like we, don't, we don't have a license for that. And yet this is what he did, and, and so we've gotta look at this today, and we've gotta understand what is going on, why is this moment happening? So let's just go and, and just kinda hit some of the highlights of the story uh, again that you just heard, just to kinda point out a couple of key details. You know, so the first thing is this moment where Jesus has been doing all this miraculous stuff, just what God's supposed to do, and then he calls his 12 closest followers together, and he starts sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. And so they do. They go out, they tell everyone they meet to repent of their sins and turn to God, and they cast out many demons and they healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. If there's one thing more shocking than Jesus asking his disciples to do this, it's that they actually did it and it worked. In fact, they come back to him a few months later and, and they gather around him and they report to him all that they had done and taught. Would you not have wanted to be a part of that debrief session? So I went up and I said, demon get out and it did. And then that guy, he was like coughing up a lung, and I said, be healthy, and he stopped coughing. It was amazing, pretty cool. And if I were the ministry leader in Jesus' shoes, it's kind of a far out assumption for me to make, I'd have been pretty satisfied with that. I'd have been like, that was a really hard thing, guys. I'm really proud of you. You really stepped up your game in a big way. But what we see instead is that he puts them in a position, he actually ups the ante a little bit. See, he's out there teaching this huge crowd, way out in a desolate place. They're not near any towns or villages or McDonald's, anything like that. And if I'm the disciples, I'm getting really anxious. A, because they were interrupting our quiet time with our, with our master, like the guy that we're following. And you know, so I'm already frustrated with this crowd. But now I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, it's been a couple of hours, Jesus. It's starting to get late in the day. Yeah, yeah, we get it, the meek will inherit the earth, but these people are about to get real hangry. 
Like, come on. And then Jesus just keeps talking. And you're just like, do you not notice that we're about to have a, an insurrection on our hands if we don't deal with these people? And then they finally, their anxiety and their frustration get so high that they finally interrupt him. And they'd be like, hey, Jesus, these people got to eat. And in this moment, he says, well, then feed them. Casting out demons, that's one thing. I mean, that's pretty hard. Healing people, that seems so. There's 5,000 men plus all of their families. You want us to feed them? It would take more than half a year's wages. What do you mean feed them? This is impossible. And then when he shows them that this thing they thought was impossible actually is possible to God, he, he's not just done there. Then he puts them in this perilous situation, this moment. He sends them out into a boat and they're stuck in the Sea of Galilee in the middle of this storm. They're straining at the oars. They're, they're trying just not to get swamped and drown. And so shortly before dawn, like, as they're in the midst of it, they think they're moments away from death. He goes out walking on the water. And this isn't encouraging as he's about to walk by them. They see him and, and how do they feel? Are they relieved? Are, are they like, oh good, God's here? No, they think he's a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and they were terrified. Sounds like a pretty good gig being an apostle of Jesus, doesn't it? Who signs up for that? And in fact, we need to think about this and look at it because as Mark has been describing this unsettling work of Jesus, you may have noticed that there are some different reactions that people have, right? When you see the teaching and healing of Jesus, uh, there, there are a couple different ways that you can react. And the first one that we see is that some people just flat out reject it, right? I mean, these are the religious leaders, the people who were pretty content with the status quo. They didn't like things changing. They, they just rejected him. Or maybe even, as you heard last week, Dion Garrett was talking about the people of Jesus' hometown. And uh, yeah, they weren't interested in, in hearing any teaching or healing from Jesus. They knew this guy. Some people reject him. Some people, in fact, I'd say the majority of people that we've been hearing about up to this point, uh, they actually just receive this teaching and healing. They're so grateful. You know, they're sick, they're paralyzed, they're hurting, they're demon-possessed, they've got all these things wrong, and they're just so grateful to have someone who seems to have a solution. Or maybe they love hearing his teaching, and, and oh, these are just such great words of wisdom. We're just so glad to hear it, and they receive it. And this is mostly what we've seen and what Mark has emphasized for the last few weeks. But today, he confronts us with a third group of people a group of people that Jesus actually calls not just to passively receive, but to reflect his teaching and healing to the broader world. And that Mark's gonna emphasize this group of people today. And what's interesting is I kind of look through the options of the way people tend to react to Jesus. These are pretty much the same options 2,000 years later as they were back then. I mean, here we are in 2019, and some people are exposed to Jesus' teaching and healing, and they don't, they're not interested in any of it. And, and frankly, it makes even more sense today because they're not even directly witnessing miraculous healings and demon uh, exorcisms. They're not witnessing any of that. They're witnessing a church uh, that's teaching and healing sometimes doesn't feel like it's all that wise or loving, doesn't feel like it's all that powerful or healing. And so people pretty reasonably reject what they're exposed to. Or I think there's a larger group that has received Jesus' teaching healing and is grateful for it, is just passively done. I'd say this is uh, a lot of people that I talk to that they, they believe in Jesus, they are confident that they are gonna go to heaven because of that belief, and they're good. They don't necessarily look for anything more. They're not asking to follow Jesus in any more intimate way or let him actually reorient their lives. They're grateful for this thing that he's done, and they're ready to call it a day. And then there is a group of people that, that says, hey, maybe this, this healing, this offering of heaven that God gives us, maybe this is just the first step. Maybe there's actually more that God has for me. And it's not just enough that he promises me I've got a spot reserved in heaven. Maybe there's something to a transformed life that would come from following Jesus. And I don't want you to walk away thinking like that this is the obvious Sunday school answer I'm gonna lead you towards. In fact, any one of these is a reasonable thing to do, and, and I want us to wrestle honestly with what it looks like to be in these different camps. After all, I mean, think about just people that receive healing. It's actually a pretty normal thing to just be thankful for the healing you got and move on with your life, right? 
I mean, some of you were here a few weeks ago when I shared about how my wife had this really um, terrible pain that was like ruining her life. Uh, and a month of just debilitating uh, agony and pain. And we did finally figure out what it was, uh, and she had an abscess in one of her teeth that was right on a nerve that was like spreading all over. And, and so we found an endodontist, and they did an emergency um, root canal for her, and, uh, and it was amazing. Like she went from, you know, agony, you know, nine out of 10 on the pain scale, couldn't even think, you know, uh, to they did this thing, and instantly she was all better, right? But then, we didn't make the endodontist like a central part of our life or anything. <laughs> we don't have a plaque in our living room that says, as for me and my household, we will serve the endodontist. <laughs> We're grateful for what they did and we've gone back to living life the way we want to live it. And a lot of people, they have that relationship with Jesus and if that works for them, I can't necessarily say that you shouldn't, but what I can say and what Mark paints a picture of today is that maybe there is something to this third group. That if you're willing to not just passively receive what Jesus has to offer in some limited ways, but to actually reflect what he does, he might actually do some pretty amazing things. And the fact that you're sitting here tells me that you're at least open to considering what this might look like to be in this third group of people. And this is who Mark is describing for us in episode six today. So let's, let's kind of look through the story that you just heard and let's kind of see what Mark is describing for those people who actually want to be in that third group, who want to follow and reflect Jesus, are willing to submit themselves to his commands. The first thing he's gonna do is he asks you to do hard things. All right, that's what we saw. I hope you noticed, maybe you didn't, but when he asked the disciples to cast out demons and heal people, they didn't just flip out. I mean, I would have if, if someone asked me to do that. that. That feels pretty bad. But they actually were, were kind of okay with it. It was difficult and it was intimidating, but it wasn't completely out of the ordinary. Why? Well, because they'd been following Jesus for two years at that point. They knew it was possible. It's like that moment when you give your 15-year-old the keys to the car and you say, now you're gonna learn how to drive yourself. Like it's hard, it's intimidating, it's maybe a little scary for both the teenager and the parent. But at the end of the day, they've seen you driving for 15 years. They know that this is probably something that's within their capacity to do. He asked them to do hard things and they did them as we saw. But then here's, the, here's where Jesus kind of veers for me personally. I would probably be content with that first thing, but then after they've successfully accomplished hard things, he really does up the end. He says, okay, now that you've done that, now I want you to do impossible things. When they're confronted with this crowd, again, they've seen healings, they've seen demons being cast out, they've seen Jesus do some pretty crazy stuff. No one's seen feeding a crowd with nothing. This is impossible, even by the definition of people who have been empowered to cast out demons. This is big and this is beyond. And so he puts them in this position. And then he's still not done with them. After he puts this impossible thing in front of them, after he does this impossible miracle, then he intentionally puts them in danger. Did you catch that? This is Jesus, as we saw last week, he commands the storms. It wasn't an accident that he put them in a boat and he stayed on land. He knew what was coming. And he put them in the boat intentionally and said he forced them to go in the boat without him. And he sent them out into a lake knowing that a storm was coming. And then when, they're, when they're, he waits for them to be at the, at the last bit of their rope, when, when there's nothing left but to just kind of say their prayers and, and wait to die, and at the last moment, he comes out and he saves them. And even then, they're terrified in that moment. They're not grateful or appreciative. They're just, they're just shocked. And these are the things that Mark describes Jesus doing to those who agree to follow him. And so then the question that I'm left with as I'm reflecting on this this week, why would anyone sign up for this? Why would anyone want and willingly agree to follow Jesus? Why would Jesus even do it to us? I see some sort of sadomasochist that wants to just really do all these awful things and put us in these terrible situations. We know he can already heal people and cast out demons. We know he can do this himself. Why does he put his followers, the people that he's closest to, through this order of, of a program? And so here's what I think. I think that there's a few reasons and, and we'll walk through them together. The first is that I think this is actually for our benefit, that Jesus puts us in a position to do hard things and then impossible things, and then life-threatening 
things. I think it's actually for us. And I think even with the first one, you see this, right? Like we know this in regular life that you have to do hard things in order to grow. That if you don't do hard things, if you don't challenge people, then they stay right where they are. And the disciples had gotten comfortable watching Jesus do all the hard stuff and now he's saying to them, you've gotta do it for your sake, you need to grow. I got to experience this recently. We, um, we recently unearthed our, our decade-old Nintendo Wii gaming system, and we've been playing Super Mario Galaxy, which is an old game. And I was letting my kids play, and they were having a lot of fun, but then Sai would keep getting to these hard parts in the game, and, and, and he'd get to this hard part, and he'd immediately hand me the controller and say, all right, Dad, you get me past this part. You do it. And initially, I did, because it was kind of fun showing off to my kids how good their dad is at Super Mario Galaxy. Oh, yeah, I got this. But then after a couple of times of that, I realized every time it got hard, he was just handing it to me. And I was like, the point of this game is for him to play and to learn and to have fun. And, uh, and it's not actually for me to just show off how good I am to my kids. And so the next time I said, no, bud, you can do this. I know it's hard, but you can do it. And you know what he did? He got really upset and he cried. <laughs> he didn't want to play anymore. And I said, well, that's all right. We can go do chores. All right, I'll play. <laughs> And he got there, right? It took him a few minutes, it took him a few deaths, it took him some time, but he beat the boss. And it was amazing to watch him, who just a few minutes earlier was so, was so fearful and scared and upset, and to then watch it replaced with confidence and pride as he overcame something that had been difficult. He needed to be put in the position to do a hard thing in order to grow. And so far, I think we're all tracking with this. It makes sense that a leader would have you do hard things. Here's where it gets wonky, for me at least that he's not content with that, that Jesus doesn't just stop there. He says, no, I actually want you to do impossible things, and this is also for your benefit. And the picture is this moment where the crowds come, and they're, they're interrupting Jesus and his friends. They're, they're putting themselves in kind of a foolish spot, and they're in this moment where it is nearly impossible to figure out how they're gonna resolve the situation of a hungry crowd, and the nearest town is miles away. And yet you get a glimpse of why Jesus was willing to be put in that position and more importantly to put his disciples in that position. It says that when he got off the shore and he saw the crowds, his heart broke and he was filled with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that in fact, there's this connection that we see throughout scripture and especially in this moment that impossible things are what put us in a position to open up our hearts in ways that they hadn't been opened before. In fact, when the Bible kind of criticizes the disciples, it says they didn't understand this miracle of the loaves and the fishes because their hearts were hard. And again, these are the people that love Jesus. They're the people that have chosen to follow him, the people that have willingly done hard things, and yet it says that their hearts are still hard because they don't yet have compassion. And that being put in impossible situations, the only way to get through those is to actually develop and awaken compassion in your own heart. I've seen this play out personally. I remember when my wife and I got married, we, we charted out a plan for our married life. And one of the pieces of that plan was we did not wanna have kids for five years because we were broke uh, and in debt and she was still in college. And we are like, this it wouldn't make sense. It, it wouldn't be financially responsible. It doesn't seem possible to have kids too early. We need to have a few years to get in a good financial footing before we have kids. And then one year in, we got pregnant because God does this kind of thing to us. And in this moment where it felt so impossible, like we had just barely paid off the wedding at that point, and we're confronted with this reality that now we're gonna have to pay for a baby, something that we were not ready for, it did not feel within the realm of possibility for us. And yet baby was coming whether we liked it or not, and then when we, we got to see our daughter for the first time, suddenly something changes in your heart, right? And you start to say, we're gonna make this work. Yeah, it felt impossible, but when when there's a reason for it, when there's someone that you love or that you care about, that you have mercy and compassion for, suddenly you find a way to make the impossible possible. See, Jesus puts us in this position because it is the best way to open up and soften our hearts, to teach us compassion for the crowds and the people that are hurting around us. So all right, that makes sense, that works, but, but then we still get to this one, and this is the one that, that gets really dicey for me because it just feels malicious on Jesus' part. I mean, it feels like a, a, a divine level prank gone wrong. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna put you in a boat and you're gonna think you're gonna die. It's gonna be hilarious. 
And yet as you look at it, the disciples got something in that moment that no one else, anyone in the other two groups of people would ever have experienced. Right, you, you see that, that for the last few weeks, there are these crowds of people who are blessed and healed by Jesus in a variety of ways. And they've received healing from something that ails them. They've received wisdom that helps them navigate life. They've gotten something powerful and good from Jesus. But you know what they haven't gotten? This moment where you're at the end of your rope, where everything is crashing down around you and you see no way out other than your own extinction. And God himself comes walking across the waves to rescue you personally. From this moment on, the disciples would never doubt again that God himself had their backs. Other people, they got healing, they got, they got something good from God. God gives good gifts to everybody. The disciples got hope. And in fact, it's only by going through the perilous things, it's, it's only by seeing our life be risked that God gives us this most powerful gift of all, this trust and hope that he personally has our backs, that he's right there with us in these moments. And in fact, that, that thing was not just true in this one instance for the disciples on this one time and this one lake. A year later, when they would witness their Lord tortured to death in front of them. And they spent three days in uncertainty and fear and darkness, wondering what was gonna happen next and how long before the religious leaders came to kill them. And three days later, Jesus showed up, looking like a ghost, because they knew he was dead. And he said to them in much the same way he did on the lake, he said, don't be afraid, it's me. Touch my hands, touch my side, I'm here. And death itself has no power over you. And in that moment, they didn't have to be confused because they remembered what it had been like. They'd experienced it before. And in this moment, we have the exact same promise of God for us that if we're willing to faithfully follow him, if we're willing to put ourselves in positions where we get into perilous moments, we will see God show up because death itself cannot overcome those who follow and reflect Jesus's power and teaching. It's for our own good that Jesus asks us to walk through these steps with him if we want to follow him. And it's not just for our own good. If that's enough for you, it's great, but it's also for the good of the world. Do you guys realize this, that, that Jesus is not content to let one person be healed. He wants the entire world to be healed. John, one of these disciples that was in the boat, he shares Jesus' last words before his death, and he says this, this is what Jesus said. He said, very truly I tell you, my followers, that whoever believes in me doesn't reject me, doesn't just passively receive a little bit of blessing from me. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Not only that, they will do even greater things than these. This unsettling guy who casts out demons, who heals the sick, who walks on water, who raises the dead, says that his disciples, me, you, are gonna do greater things than what he's done. Shocking, isn't it? This is the surgeon handing you the scalpel and you don't think you should be holding it at all. And yet the reality is there are seven billion people in this world and God, when he limited himself to become a human being, to walk the earth for a few short years, doing these miracles through his divine power, knew that there were gonna be seven billion people that needed his followers to reflect his power and teaching. He needs you to do the work of people around you. There are people who are sick and hurting who need a comforting, healing hand. There are people who are starving who need someone to come alongside and support and provide for them. There are people who are hopeless and in despair who need someone to come and proclaim a hopeful word that can triumph over even death. The world needs you. And here's what I'll say, because I know this feels like the surgeon handing you the scalpel. Here's what I will say about this. He does not 
set you up for failure. He's not asking you to do this impossible thing in some way that's gonna make you accidentally hurt someone or hurt yourself. What he promises is that if you will be my follower, if you will walk these steps, he will provide you with something that no one else gets access to. This is how Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians. Paul, as he's facing the reality of, of the world and the mission field, people that are hurting and broken, who need good news, who need healing, who need miraculous efforts from Christ's followers, he says this, we are confident to face all of these things because of our great trust in God through Christ. And then he says this, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. Hear this now, it is not that any of us think that we are qualified to do anything on our own. Jesus sends the disciples out to cast out demons and heal the sick. They weren't healing the sick because they had a medical degree. They weren't casting out demons because they'd gone to exorcism class. They didn't have qualifications. What they had was Christ's qualification that he gave them freely. And so we have a choice to make. We can navigate life one of two ways. We can choose to try to go through life based on our own qualifications, based on our own skill set, our own efforts, our own ability to predict the dangers of this world and prepare ourselves to face them. I'm gonna get the right training, the right schooling, the right resources so that I can take care of myself my whole life. And you might get pretty far going that way, but there's going to come that moment where the stock market reverses and that nest egg you'd spent decades saving up isn't there waiting for you anymore. There's gonna come that moment when, when the industry changes and this skill that you spent decades honing is no longer considered a valuable resource and you are out of work. There's gonna come that moment like the storm where sickness or disease or the aftershocks of life come against you and nothing that you did to prepare will actually prepare you in that moment. What I can say is if you choose this route of qualification, it can get you so far, but you will be left in despair at some point. Or you can choose to let Christ's qualifications get you through. You can choose to let his power and his equipping be the thing that navigates you through life. And on the one hand, it is a scarier way to be. It's much more comforting to just rely on the things that you've developed and built for yourself. This is scary, but on the other hand, it comes with a promise that if you pick this route, you cannot fail. I know that sounds shocking, but, but this is important, that if you let the qualifications of Christ be what you use to navigate life, failure is taken away as an option for you. I know that sounds bold, so let, let me really, really break this down. Notice what happened in the lives of these apostles. Jesus gave them his qualifications. He said, go cast out demons. And what happened? They cast out demons. It worked. But then he confronts them with this crowd and he says, all right, go feed this crowd. And were they able to? No, they didn't. And did Jesus in that moment say, well, I guess they're gonna go hungry and they're gonna tear us limb from limb in their, in their anger. No, he fed the crowd for them. Or Jesus gave them this opportunity. He said, hey, you've got my qualifications. You've got my power with you. Go be out in the storm without me and, and see if you can trust that I'm not gonna let you drown. And did they? No. They were terrified. They blew it. They blew it in a big way with the crowd, they blew it in a big way in the boat, and at no point did Jesus let their failure dictate their outcome. Because if you rely on his qualifications and his power, he shows up to do the impossible, miraculous thing. He shows up to save your life. Not just in this world, but in the next as well, that no matter what happens, you will not die and have it be the end of your story. If we let Jesus' qualifications be the thing that drives us and, and equips us and makes us feel confident, then we cannot fail. That is why I would encourage you and why I try to be one of those who follows Jesus, who reflects his teaching and power, and who embraces this uh, regimen that he lays out for us. And I'll be honest and transparent with you today. 
if I'm looking at myself, I probably live right about here. I, I think I do a fairly good job of intentionally doing hard things, hearing the teachings of God and saying, all right, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. All right, that's hard, but, but I, I'm gonna trust that if I do that, that's gonna go well for me and for the world. And I've accidentally dipped my toes in two and three. I don't choose it. I'm not looking for impossible things, and yet just through the circumstances of life, I have been here at points in my life, and what I can tell you is, he's never not shown up. I'm standing here today. And it wasn't always in the way I would have liked or the way I would have predicted or the way I hoped that he was gonna show up. And yet when impossible things have presented themselves, somehow I've gotten through them. And when life-threatening things have happened, I'm here now today. But even if I weren't, I've learned trust that whatever happens to me in this life, he will not abandon or forsake me. And I've learned it by walking through these steps. I don't wanna hold myself up as some sort of you know, perfect follower of Jesus, I'm not, but I'll give you one example of someone that is a hero uh, of mine, and it's this guy Martin Luther we've been talking about. And maybe you don't know that story because it is a 500-year-old story, but, but if what you know is he was a monk trying to follow Jesus. And as he was confronted with Jesus' righteousness, th this voice saying that you've gotta be perfect like the Pharisees are perfect, you've gotta do all of these, uh, you, you can't mess up, you can't sin, if you sin, you gotta confess, he really took it seriously and he tried so hard to live that way. And in fact, he was confessing seven, eight, nine times a day, day and night. He'd have a sinful dream and he'd wake up in the middle of the night and wake up his father confessor to confess it because he was willing to do the hard thing. And as he did it, he actually came to realize pretty quickly that it wasn't just a hard thing, it was in fact an impossible thing, that no one can be righteous enough for God in their own efforts. No one is qualified enough. And as he faced that truth hard, he started to realize the stuff that's going on, the, these poor people that are being taken advantage of and being told that they can get into heaven if they just give enough money to the church. He took a stand, even though that seemed impossible, even though no one thought that that could be done or that one monk could do such a thing. And in fact, by doing it, in 1521, he stood up before the Diet of Worms. He stood in front of the emperor of the whole Western world, Charles V, and they told him, you need to take back what you're saying or we will kill you. And these famous words that have passed down for 500 years, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. And that's become legend and lore for us now, but you gotta understand the moment he said those words, his life wasn't worth the paper it was written on because it was just waiting for the emperor to sign his execution warrant. And yet God showed up in a powerful way. He protected Luther from certain death and in fact used him to completely change the world. Whether you're a believer or not, whether you're a Lutheran or not, this world looks the way it does today because of this follower of Christ's efforts. He changed the political structure. He changed faith. He even changed the way that we see ourselves as human beings. The fact that we feel like we have the power and the right to elect our leaders is something that did not exist before this guy took a stand and put himself in the path of all these things for the sake of following his Lord. And I don't know what God's going to ask you to do. In fact, it might sound like a hard word to say, if you choose to follow and reflect Jesus, these are the things that are in your path waiting for you. But what I can say is if you will take it seriously, if you'll look at a hard teaching and say, hey, there are sheep without a shepherd and they need my compassion, you will choose compassion over moral righteousness, over having the right answer or the solution to life's problems. If you will just let compassion guide the way you interact with others, as hard as that is, God's gonna bless it. He's gonna bless you. He's gonna bless those around you to whom you are showing compassion. He's gonna give you a chance to have an impact that far outweighs what you would have had if you just sat back and passively received this one little promise of heaven. I encourage you to step out in faith today, just like the disciples were forced to do in the water. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the example that you have given us, that you had your friend and close follower, Mark, write down what he and the other apostles experienced so that we could see and be challenged and encouraged by it today. Thank you for the example of Martin Luther and other of your followers who stood up against everything that the world was throwing at him so that we here now could live in the hope of your good news of salvation. 
And Lord, I pray that you would encourage and empower each and every one of us to willingly choose to put ourselves on your track, to take a courageous step and face the hard, the impossible, the perilous things that you know are for our good and for the good of the world around us. We pray in your holy name, amen. As we make these bold choices, we need